uses of uh, contracts such as the umbrella contracts are ones that we would wish to discourage where possible. Hey, thanks. And that concludes the portfolio questions. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12226 in the name of John Swinney on the Budget Scotland number 4 bill. I'd invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak but as now or as soon as possible. And I call on John Swinney to speak to and move the motion. John, um, Deputy First Minister, 14 minutes, please. Uh, President officer, the Budget Bill confirms our spending plans to deliver a more prosperous and a, fa and a fairer Scotland. Although the latest economic indicators continue to be encouraging, we recognise that a strong economy is only successful if it is underpinned by a society that is fair and equitable. To ensure that all of our citizens have the opportunity to achieve their potential, today's budget will invest £16.6 million to implement the findings of the Wood Commission on Developing Scotland's Young Workforce, spend £526 million in our colleges and over £1 billion in our universities, expand our modern apprenticeship programme towards a target of 30,000 starts each year by 2020, secure capital investment of around £4.5 billion in our schools, hospitals, homes and transport networks, allocate £81 million to mitigate the most harmful impacts of the UK Government's welfare reforms and deliver over £200 million to support health and social care integration. These are just some of the measures we are taking forward to create a fair and a prosperous Scotland. We have also taken progressive decisions on land and buildings transaction tax, which mean that 50 per cent of residential transactions at the lower end of the property market will be taken out of tax altogether providing a welcome boost to first-time buyers and the property market into the bargain. Over 90 per cent of taxpayers will pay no tax at all or be better off compared to the UK's current tax rates. Our landfill rates balance concerns over waste tourism with the appropriate financial incentives needed to deliver our zero waste ambitions. We will maintain the most competitive business environment in the UK. 95 per cent of non-residential taxpayers are better or no worse off than under LBTT. We will not only continue to support the Small Business Bonus Scheme, worth an estimated £172 million to businesses the length and the breadth of Scotland in 2015-16, but we will also invest £11 million to match the poundage for business rates south of the border. I have taken a prudent approach to forecasting revenues from the devolved taxes, and my forecasts have been endorsed as reasonable by the Independent Fiscal Commission. With tax devolution, however, inevitably comes an increase in the exposure to risk, and I have decided to hold £15 million in 2015-16 to provide insurance against such risk. Our economic strategy is working, but we must continue to act swiftly to address Scotland's economic challenges. We have established the Energy Jobs Task Force to help the economy of the North East, and we have committed to the Apprenticeship Guarantee for oil and gas. And we give the categorical assurance that we will deploy the leadership, the energy and the resources of our enterprise and skills network to tackle economic problems wherever they emerge in Scotland. We recognise, however, that in some circumstances the substantive powers to tackle these issues lie out with our control, and I would urge once again the United Kingdom Government to reduce the supplementary charge, invest in exploration credits and back our North Sea oil and gas industry. Our, our tax measures, presiding officer, will support the housing market and these are complemented by our investment in housing supply. We are more than two-thirds of the way towards delivering our five-year target of 30,000 additional affordable homes by March 2016, including 20,000 homes for social rent. But we recognise that within that approach there is more that has to be done to tackle fuel poverty and improve energy efficiency within the housing stock. Over half a million tonnes of carbon and over £200 million in household fuel bills will be saved over the lifetime of the measures installed through our programmes in 2013-14. Improving energy efficiency not only helps to address both social and environmental inequality, it can also improve our housing stock and support our economy by creating and sustaining employment. That is why we are already investing £94 million in 2014-15, a higher level of funding than ever before. However, too many people are continuing to struggle with the cost of heating their homes this winter. Having listened to points raised by parliamentary committees, I can announce that we will increase investment in domestic energy efficiency 
by £20 million to provide a total budget of £114 million in 2015-16. The extra £20 million of investment announced today gives clear and powerful impetus to our efforts to tackle fuel poverty and it also has a positive impact on tackling climate change emissions from our efforts on housing. Patrick Harvey. Grateful to the Deputy First Minister for giving way and any increase in this area, as we've argued consistently over many years, is welcome. But is the figure of £20 million extra calculated on the basis of what is necessary to meet the fuel poverty targets or contribute to the climate change targets? The, the, the lack of an assessment of what scale of investment is needed is one of the issues that has been raised by us as well as by committees. Deputy First Minister. We are considering the full extent of the scale of investment that would be required to tackle this issue, which is an issue raised with us by the Economy Committee of Parliament. And I wouldn't for a moment suggest that the £20 million that has been allocated today would address all of the requirement in this particular area. But what it is, is a solid commitment by this government to tackle fuel poverty, to tackle energy efficiency and to make a constructive contribution towards the realisation of our climate change targets to which the government uh, attaches great significance. Our efforts on carbon reduction will be complemented by an additional £4 million of capital funding to support cycling infrastructure in 2015-16 and ministers will announce the details of this investment shortly. To deliver a fairer society, we must focus on the importance of creating a culture of fair work. This government has targeted its pay policy at those on the lowest incomes, including through measures such as the Scottish Living Wage. Over 100 companies across Scotland are now accredited as living wage employers, benefiting 100,000 individuals, and we aim to expand this number to 150 companies by the end of the year. We will also promote better engagement of employees in business through the establishment of the Fair Work Convention this year. We are pleased with the progress, uh, not at this stage, we are pleased with the progress that has been made, supported by the additional funding of £200,000 that we allocated in November to the Poverty Alliance to encourage more employers to deliver the living wage in Scotland. But we are determined to do all that we can and announce today that I will allocate an additional £200,000 in 2015-16 to support further progress in our Fair Work objectives. Presiding Officer, the health of our population and the education of our young people uh, I will be, yes. I wonder if Mr Swinney in his speech could advise us why the Scot Scottish Government has delayed releasing the guidance on the living wage in terms of procurement. Uh, First well, Minister. The, the Government's making clear progress on the implementation of the living wage and I would have thought Mr uh, Finlay could have welcomed that. The health of our population and the education of our young people are two of the most important responsibilities of Government. Our overall investment in the National Health Service is building a health service fit for the 21st century. As a result of our frontline investment, patient satisfaction has increased with 85% of people fairly or very satisfied with their local health services, an increase of 4%. Hospitals are cleaner, with cases of MRSA reduced by 89% since 2007. Over 600,000 patients are treated within the 12-week treatment time guarantee. Full-time NHS staff numbers have increased by over 9,600 under the SNP Government, and figures released this week for accident and emergency waiting times show nine out of ten people were seen within four hours between October and December 2014, and 99% of all a &E attendees were admitted, discharged or transferred within eight hours, a record that is better than performance in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And we have protected our hospitals. Accident and emergency departments at Monklands and Ayr remain open, handling 827,000 attendances since 2007. We will sign contracts for a new Edinburgh Royal Sick Children's Hospital and a Defreeson Galloway Royal Infirmary this year. And last week, NHS Greater Glasgow took ownership of the new £842 million Glasgow South Hospital that will transform the delivery of acute health care in the west of Scotland. This has been achieved by our commitment to the National Health Service, by the hard work of every member of NHS staff and through the fair funding of Scotland's health services. In October, I announced that not only would we pass on the £202 million of consequentials to the NHS, but that we would invest more. We have now gone even further. A vote for the budget today 
will see an additional £127 million of extra spending for frontline healthcare in our National Health Service, taking our additional investment for 2015-16 to £383 million. The Health Secretary has already confirmed that £98 million of those additional resources will boost the funding for territorial boards and tackle delayed discharge. I can further announce today that the balance of this extra spending will be used to establish a performance fund of £31.5 million in 2015-16 to improve the quality of care and to reduce waiting times. Scotland's health service will continue to have the benefit of a government that supports it and that funds it properly. Presiding officer, our frontline fund for the National Health Service is not £100 million, it is over £12 billion. That is real investment in the National Health Service. <laughs> yes, uh, I'll briefly. Um, Hume. I thank the uh, Deputy First Minister for taking the intervention. Can Mr uh, Swinney explain how cutting the budget allocation for general medical services, GPs, by inflation is protecting our public services. First Minister. Well, there's an extra £40 million put into uh, that particular budget line for Mr Hume's information. Uh, yesterday, I had the pleasure of meeting families for whom additional investment of over £300 million in expanded early years provision is delivering real and tangible benefits. The key focus, uh, not at this stage, no. The key focus of our work is to tackle inequality, is to ensure that Scotland is one of the best countries in the world for children to grow up. And when our youngest children enter school, they should have access to the best possible education. The evidence is clear that the foundations of a successful education system lie in the quality of teachers. We have thousands of excellent teachers across Scotland, but we need not just to maintain, but to improve the high standards that we have set. We have been consistent in our commitment to maintain teacher numbers in line with pupil numbers as a central part of our priority to raise attainment. Over the period 2011-12 to 2014-15, we have provided additional funding to local authorities of £134 million specifically to support them in maintaining teacher numbers. As part of this year's budget process, we agreed to enter discussions with COSLA on educational <coughs> outcomes, including teacher numbers. However, following the results of the, the teacher census in December, we reviewed our approach. It is important to stress that we have worked successfully in partnership with local authorities on a range of issues and we remain committed to that partnership. I also recognise the very real budgetary pressures facing all of the public sector, including local government, as budgets are set for 2015-16. However, when specific and sufficient funding is available to maintain the employment of teachers, it is not acceptable that the number of teachers declined slightly last year and the ratio of pupils to teachers rose slightly into the bargain. In discussion with COSLA and in line with our objective to maintain teacher numbers, I have offered to suspend the penalty for 2014-15 that I was entitled to apply as a result of the fallen teacher numbers and also to provide a further £10 million next year on top of the previously allocated £41 million to support the employment of teachers. At this stage, Despite the support of SNP councils, COSLA has been unable to agree to what I consider to be a fair and generous offer of government support to deliver a good outcome for our children. As a result, this government has no alternative in order to protect teacher numbers and to deliver the educational standards we want to see, but to make that funding available on a council-by-council -council basis if and only if they are prepared to sign up to a clear commitment to protect teacher numbers. £41 million is available at the start of this financial year as planned. However, let me be clear, any council which does not make that commitment and demonstrate that it can be achieved will have their share of the £41 million clawed back before April. For those who share our ambition, to maintain teacher numbers and deliver on their commitment, a further £10 million is available following the teacher census in December. However, a failure to deliver will result in a further clawback of funding. So to each of Scotland's 32 local authorities, let me say this. My door is open. I therefore call on each council to make that commitment, access the resources we have made available and deliver the teachers that our children yeah. deserve. Yeah.
the, the education of Scotland's children is the key to both their future and to the future of Scotland. However, too many of our young people have life chances narrowed by circumstances out of their control. As we signalled in the programme for government, tackling inequality is one of our key priorities. I am today announcing the first tranche of additional funding to tackle educational inequality within Scotland. This government will provide £20 million in the coming year to be followed by further funding in next year's budget to focus minds and efforts on supporting those in education who face some of the greatest challenges. Further details on this announcement will be set out shortly. Presiding officer, this budget provides new affordable and energy efficient homes as well as support to first time buyers looking to enter the housing market and assistance to people as they progress up the property ladder. It supports our economy through investment in education, a supportive business environment and by removing obstacles to people getting into work. It delivers the social wage, protects household incomes and our high quality public services and it provides funding of over £12 billion for health. It puts the life chances of our young children at the heart of what we do with the investment in childcare, further funding for teachers and new efforts to tackle inequality and to give every child in Scotland the best possible education opportunity. It is for all of these reasons that I commend the Budget to Parliament and move the motion. Many thanks. I now call on Jackie Bailey. Ten minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome the opportunity to participate in the Stage 3 debate this afternoon. Labour approached the budget this year with three very clearly defined asks. A frontline fund of £100 million for our NHS, in addition to the money already going in. A resilience fund of £10 million to mitigate the large-scale job losses and a Scottish Office of Budget Responsibility at less than a £1 million to ensure trust and transparency with independent financial scrutiny and economic forecasting. We also ask that the Cabinet Secretary sit down with local government to look at the huge cuts having to be made to their budgets, most notably in education. And despite much laughter from the SNP benches a fortnight ago, that's exactly what the Cabinet Secretary has done in relation to teacher numbers, but more of that later. Our budget requests have been based on what we believe is in the interest of the country and also of immediate need. There is no shopping list, but a series of measured requests that are all fully costed. Mr Swinney has substantial resources available from Barnet Consequentials arising from the Autumn Statement, and these can fund in full all of our budget requests. Let me start with the frontline fund for our NHS. And you know, I listened very carefully to what the Cabinet Secretary had to say. There is not one penny more allocated to health than simply announcing what you would do with the remaining 127 million consequentials already allocated to health. No one, no one can be in any doubt about the pressure that our hospitals and accident and emergency departments are under. And despite the very best efforts of our NHS staff, there is a limit to what they can do without the backup of adequate resources. Literally every week, newspaper headlines highlighted the crisis in A&E. There were stories of older people lying on trolleys for as much as 21 hours waiting for a bed. In another case, I know of a woman who was discharged from hospital in the morning, suffering from acute COPD, readmitted to A&E in the afternoon, and then spent more than 12 hours on a trolley waiting for a bed. She was clearly not fit to be discharged, but such was the pressure on beds, she was sent home far too early, only to end up back in one on the same day. That was an inefficient use of NHS resources. And we also witnessed porter cabins, mothballed for years, pressed into use. Such was the pressure. And if you needed any more convincing presiding officer, you only need to look at the A&E stats published yesterday. The target for waiting times at A&E has not been met. Some health boards only manage 85% against a target of 95%. And of course, the real target that the Scottish Government want to quietly drop is in fact 98%. And these stats were for the last quarter of 2014, before there was significant additional pressure on our NHS. Clinicians tell me that there's no longer such a thing as winter pressures. This is now the norm all year round. 
January saw hospital after hospital under strain, some closing their doors to any new admissions like the Western General in Glasgow and the Royal Alexandra Hospital in Paisley. So I fear things will get worse before they get better. And we've been subjected to daily stories about the state of the NHS in England too. And I watched the documentary the other night that exposed the extent of the problem in A&E. That was bad enough. But you know, it turns out that Scotland is worse than the NHS in England. And we don't have to contend with the reforms inflicted on the NHS in England by David Cameron. Now, the Cabinet Secretary talks about the budget being over £12 billion. What he won't talk about is the IFS report that suggested that there was a real terms reduction on health spending in Scotland. And I seem to recall at the time that the excuse was that they hadn't dealt with the Commonwealth Games, which was in the health budget. Today, I understand that the excuse is the efficient way the Cabinet Secretary deals with capital. I look forward to the next excuse appearing over the horizon, but would suggest consistency in excuses might be desirable. Might I also point out to the Cabinet Secretary that for the period 2007 to 2010, when there was a Labour government in the United Kingdom, the NHS was given inflation-busting increases, yet the SNP failed to pass those on fully to our NHS in Scotland. Do you know, perhaps if you had, we wouldn't be in the position we're in just now. Our NHS Frontline Fund would help move the hospital to some evening and weekend working so that elective procedures can be carried out at weekend, diagnostics in the evenings, making best use of our hospitals and easing the pressure on a and &E. I'm told that the Scottish Government will review the position, but the truth is we've had reviews. We've even had pilots, at least four in different health boards in 2013, and since then we've had silence. The need is self-evident, the time for review is past, the time for action is now, and there is not one new penny allocated by the Cabinet Secretary today. <laughs> Let me turn to education, because I have highlighted the very tight financial settlement given to local government and the particular impact this is having on the delivery of education. And whilst I am pleased that the Cabinet Secretary has engaged in discussion with COSLA about maintaining teacher numbers, it clearly is the case that no agreement has been reached and he has imposed a deal. Now, I think that's a first. I think the concordat that he signed up to now lies in tatters. But the terms of Mr Swinney's offer are curious. I think the original letter said 8 million. I heard him say 10, so I take that as an improvement. But one local authority said it just wasn't enough, that the amount they would receive, and it wasn't a Labour-controlled local authority, the amount they would receive doesn't even cover the advertising bill for new teachers. He also talks about sanctions being applied collectively. Order! which would be administratively difficult to do, never mind being unfair. And most bizarre of all is the SNP's starting point. Their baseline is 2014, where the teacher-pupil ratio got worse, where the number of teachers fell even further. So he is accepting and building on failure. John Swinney. Her, her comments, would Jackie Bailey do something helpful? and encourage Labour councils to protect teacher numbers. Jackie Bailey. Order. Jackie Bailey. Our position is to maintain teacher numbers. The SNP, of course, promised to do just that. Yet you have failed miserably. We now have almost 4,500 fewer teachers in Scotland today than when you took charge. And in that time, according to SPICE, Spending on education, which showed a steady increase from 1999, has levelled out since 2008-9. Indeed, the government's own figures supplied to the Education Committee show a fraction of a percentage increase that is, in effect, a real terms reduction in school spending. We believe that education is a key tool in the battle against inequality. It is perhaps one of the most significant opportunities provided over a person's lifetime that enables you to overcome inequality. Yet the SNP have presided over a cut in teacher numbers, a cut in college places and a decreasing number of students from the poorest backgrounds accessing university. The SNP's approach to education actually entrenches inequality. 
Let me turn, presiding officer, to the Resilience Fund. There can be no doubt that we're witnessing, um, in a second, there can be no doubt that what we're witnessing in the North Sea with the drop in oil price has the potential to have a significant and negative impact on the economy of Scotland. The scale of the job loss could exceed the scale of loss at Ravenscraig. Only this week, we heard that Shell were drawing up plans to close the Brent field. BP were making millions, billions indeed, of pounds of spending cuts due to the drop in oil prices. 133,000 jobs in the northeast of Scotland are supported by the oil and gas industry, and that includes 46,000 in the constituency of Gordon, where Alex Salmond is standing. There may be the risk of an economic, economic tsunami in the northeast, but all of Scotland will be badly affected. The potential loss of jobs is bad enough, but the loss to public revenue is of the order of £6 billion. Let's make that sum real. That's the entirety of the school's budget for the whole of Scotland. Yet the SNP's response has been so slow, it's been positively glacial. Both the UK and Scottish governments need to do much more to help one of Scotland's key industries. Finally, presiding officer, I want to touch on our call for a Scottish Office of Budget Responsibility. This is about building trust and transparency into the forecasting of the nation's finances. And as the Smith Agreement transfers even more powers over taxation and welfare to this Parliament, we need to be sure that our scrutiny inspires confidence. A body that is wholly independent of government, able to bring oversight to our public finances and economic forecasting in a way hitherto unseen. Can I say finally, presiding officer, I am genuinely disappointed that John Swinney doesn't appear to have listened to any one of our proposals. There can be no denying the need that lies behind them. Our approach has been measured, it's been proportionate, it's been costed, the money is there. It would, however, appear that rather than work together, if the proposal comes from Scottish Labour, the SNP will put party interests before the interests of the people of Scotland. Many thanks. Order. I now call on Gavin Brown. And before I do, can I encourage everyone to follow the good example of the Deputy First Minister to make interventions standing up, not from a sedentary position. Gavin Brown. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Let me then begin, I think, with what the, First, the Deputy First Minister ended with, and that's education. And while I wasn't privy to the detail of the discussions between the Scottish Government and COSA, I cannot help but think that the education of our children in Scotland will be best served if all levels of government work together yeah. to achieve outcomes, instead of using a budget speech as a platform for creating a turf war with COSLA. I don't, think, I don't think that serves anybody any great purpose, and I think perhaps there are faults on both sides, who knows, but using a budget speech to kick COSLA when they're not in a position to stand up for themselves, I think it doesn't demonstrate... Well, well they're, not, they're, they're not speaking in this debate, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, unless, I'm, uh, unless I'm mistaken. And let's remember, we heard talk today... We heard, in, in one moment, we heard talk today of clawbacks of penalties, of ring fencing. Yet just a few months ago, the First Minister in her programme for government said that this would be a great decentralising government, yeah. Deputy Presiding yeah. Officer. So what was decentralising about today? Yeah. Well, the, the, the point I want to raise, Mr. Mr Brown's complained about me coming to Parliament and explaining the outcome of my discussions with COSLA, which I volunteered had not reached agreement. Where am I? Mr Brown would be in the front of the queue to complain if I'd made the announcement anywhere else other than in a budget speech to Parliament where I've properly informed Parliament about the unsuccessful conclusion of my negotiations with COSLA. Mr Brown. I, th I think there was a little more than factual reporting that there hadn't been an outcome. I think there was a real politicisation of education, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'm very, very happy to listen to COSLA's side of the story too before rushing to judgment. But, Deputy Presiding Officer, in terms of the changes that we have seen since the uh, draft budget announcement, I think the three most significant changes have been thanks to the Chancellor of the Exchequer and the Scottish Conservatives. We see, we see, we see money flowing to health from Barnet Consequentials through the autumn statement, £127 million worth. We see business rates increase being capped at 2% again thanks to George Osborne. 
despite the Scottish Government saying they had no plans to do this when they were asked about this in November. And of course, we see changes to LBTT. They go nowhere near far enough in our view, but we do see a 5% ban, which is a significant improvement on what went before. But, Deputy Presiding Officer, we do have two big concerns about this budget. The first one is the impact on the housing market from the land and buildings transaction tax. It is, Deputy Presiding Officer, a tax on aspiration. It is an extra obstacle, making it harder for families to own their own home. And the eye-watering 10% rate still kicks in at £325,000 compared to £925,000 under stamp duty. We are concerned that this will have a negative impact on the housing market. You need movement and activity at all rungs of the ladder. And if you hit and punish one section of the housing market, that can have an effect on all other parts of the housing market. So we ask the Scottish Government, if the Scottish housing market does perform badly relative to the UK, stripping out London, of course, but if it does perform badly relative to the rest of the UK, will the Scottish Government now take responsibility for that? Or will they blame somebody else, whether that be the UK Government or COSLA, Deputy Presiding Officer? Our preference was for a tax cut in this area, but we certainly expected the Scottish Government to, de to deliver on its own principle, which they said was revenue neutrality. But the definition of revenue neutrality appears to have changed over time, Deputy Presiding Officer. Initially, back in October, it was raising no more or less than the taxes that they replace, which, according to the Scottish Government, for residential LBTT is 198 million pounds. Definition two was it was enough to cover the block grant adjustment. And then definition three, which appeared more recently, enough to cover the block grant adjustment and put money into a cash reserve. We hear today that's going to be £15 million. But doing definition three isn't revenue neutral, Deputy Presenting Officer. In the real world, that's known as a tax increase. And that's one of the reasons why it will be impossible for us to support this budget today at stage three. Because for the Scottish Government, revenue neutral means exactly what they choose it to mean at any given time. Nothing more, nothing less. But we can put some numbers on it, Deputy Presiding Officer. They say they need to collect £231 million. But when SPICE run the numbers, drawing on the same data source, SPICE say this will collect £242 million. But that's based on just 84,000 estimated transactions. We know from another department within the Scottish Government they are predicting 100,000 transactions over the next financial year. So if 84,000 gives you £242 million, I just wonder what 100,000 transactions will actually give you over the course of the financial year. And is this really just a designed tax increase which the Government can use to put into their cash reserve or their war chest, but one which could impact negatively on the housing market and the wider economy as a whole. Deputy Presiding Officer, I only have 20 seconds or so left, so I'm afraid I'm not able to give way. But we are uh, concerned about the impact we'll have on the economy, particularly the housing market, but on business rates too, where we see um, things like the retail levy came into force, the empty property tax, and the failure to implement a retail bonus. Slowly but surely, the advantage we did have is being eroded away. And for that reason, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, we will not be supporting the budget at decision time. Thank you. Many thanks. We are extraordinarily tight for time today. Up to six minutes speeches would be welcomed. I call on Mark Macdonald to be followed by Jenny Mara. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. It's clear today that once again Mr Swinney is looking at protecting the front line despite the austerity measures that are being imposed upon Scotland. The additional money for the health service is welcome. And let us be clear about this. Um, the NHS is a vital service which all of us at some stage in our lives will rely upon and it is therefore important that that investment is protected. Now what we are seeing from the Scottish Government is uh, spending in the health service going above £12 billion and we are seeing that protection of the revenue budget. In particular in my own area in the north east of Scotland there is welcome news for NHS Grampian as a result of this. And the way to test what the public opinion is of how the health service is operating is to look at patient satisfaction in terms of patient satisfaction with the National Health Service. And we see 
in, uh, in terms of the health service as a whole and also in terms of accident emergency, high patient satisfaction levels, in particular patient satisfaction levels in relation to accident emergency above those of England and of Wales. So what we see is a strong record for the health service that is being bolstered by the investment that Mr Swinney is putting in. And the Labour Party stand up and call for a, a £100 million frontline fund set against a £12 billion plus budget. The money which is being invested in the health service is frontline funding. It is there to provide funding for those frontline services on which people rely. And I don't seek to diminish the individual cases that many of us receive as politicians because we do receive cases of people who, in our constituencies where for whatever reason the health service has not performed to the standard that we would expect it to. That won't change irrespective of the funding levels that are thrown because it is a human organisation and human organisations will have errors which will occur. The key thing is to ensure that for the overwhelming majority of people going through our health service that the support is there to ensure that they get the best treatment that we can give them and that is what this government is seeking to do. On, on the issue of, on, on the issue of, maybe a little bit later, but I've, I've got some progress that I want to make. Uh, on the issue of teacher numbers, I think that what the Cabinet Secretary has done is entirely appropriate. It is clear that COSLA is unable now to speak on behalf of all of local government because it has been unable to come to the table on behalf of local government and strike a deal with the Cabinet Secretary. Therefore, the only option that is left available to the Cabinet Secretary is to put the money on the table and for each individual local authority to declare its intentions. And I, in my own area, would uh, urge Aberdeen City Council to commit to maintaining teacher numbers in order to unlock the finances that are available uh, from the, the announcement that the Cabinet Secretary has made. And I hope that other local authorities will follow suit as well, because it is vitally important that those teacher numbers are maintained uh, in order that our young people can get the best education possible. I'll, I'll give way to Mr Rowley. Alec Rowley. Thank uh, Mr Macdonald for giving way. I agree that, that we should be doing everything within our power, and I think local authorities likewise, to maintain teacher numbers and improve education. Does he not accept that councils, the length and breadth of the country, regardless of their political makeup, is having to make major budget cuts in frontline services and education services are not exempt for that? I'm always interested by the Labour Party narrative because, on the one hand, they're all for uh, local decision making and the flexibility for councils to make their own decisions. And what this government has done across the piece in local government is to remove large amounts of ring fencing that existed prior to 2007. But in certain key areas where we have agreed key national priorities, it is, I think, entirely appropriate that councils have to fulfil their part of the bargain. And Mr Rowley was on the local government committee at the same time as I was when we had Labour-led local authorities saying they wanted flexibility over teacher numbers. And not flexibility to put teacher numbers up, flexibility to cut teacher numbers. I don't think that's acceptable. And I think the message is clear here that local authorities absolutely have to commit to maintaining teacher numbers. And if they, if they wish to, uh, within the budgets that are allocated to them, go further than that, that's fine. I'm all for that. But they, at the very least, must take the money that Mr Swinney has put forward and commit to maintaining those teacher numbers. In terms of my own area in the northeast of Scotland, I mentioned the, the uh, situation at NHS Grampian, where, thanks to the investment decisions of this government, we now see NHS Grampian receiving its population share of funding, something which was never delivered by the Labour Party when they were in power. And that will be welcome both by those staff working on the front line and by those patients in the northeast of Scotland who rely on the health service. But also, in terms of Aberdeen City Council, receiving the highest cash increase of any local authority in Scotland. But beyond that, tomorrow when the Council sets it bu its budget, it will do so in a situation where, uh, while Audit Scotland recommends that Council should hold 3% uh, of their revenue uh, in reserve, 
Aberdeen City Council is holding over a quarter in reserve, some £116 million held in cash reserves. I am calling on the Council not just to use the additional money from the Scottish Government, but also to use that money to protect frontline services and invest in preventative expenditure. And finally, in my last 15 seconds, presiding officer, I wish the Labour Party would clarify, and Jenny Mara is next, so she can clarify for us, is this a general resilience fund, or is it, as she said on the BBC just before the budget debate started, an oil resilience fund? What what is this resilience fund that Labour are proposing? Is it a general fund or is it, as Jenny Mara labelled it earlier, an oil resilience fund? Let's have the answer. Many thanks. Now call on Jenny Mara to be followed by Linda Fabiani. Up to six minutes, please. I'm always very happy, presiding officer, to provide Mark Macdonald with the answers. And if he'd been listening to our debates throughout the budget, he will know that we are proposing a resilience fund for industries that are under strain. And currently, if he was paying attention to the news in his own home region of the North East, he would know that the oil industry, as Jackie Bailey uh, pointed out to today, is under severe strain. And therefore, for that resilience fund would initially be used to support the oil industry. Presiding officer, I'd like to, if, unless Mark Macdonald has more questions for me, I'd like to, uh, to turn to uh, the health service. Presiding officer, yesterday the government published its accident and emergency figures. Not something they do very often, however, far less than in England, and we are no, still not sure why that is because the government in England publishes its A&E statistics weekly, so patients and families up and down the country can see how their National Health Service is performing. But the Health Secretary here in Scotland says she's been advised by her own agencies to publish far less often than that. And yesterday, we found out why. We also found out... Yes. Uh, I don't know if, uh, is aware that in order to be part of official statistics release, you have to make sure that it's not subject to political interference. Is she suggesting that we should politically interfere with the way official statistics are released? I think she should clarify that very carefully indeed. Jenny Mara. Suggesting that, um, that Shona Robson, who gave the intervention, is the Health Secretary and it is her job in the interests of the Scottish people and the Scottish NHS to make decisions about how information is published, on what basis, how often, in the interests of transparency. If she's saying to me she can't overrule civil servants and agencies, then I, I think that's a very, I think that is a very weak, I think that, I think... Order. I think that's quite a weak position to be in. We also, we also found out why the SNP last week decided to downgrade their A&E waiting time target from 98% to keep it at 95%. We thought 98% might be difficult when this announcement was made last week, but now we discover that 95%, their current target, is impossible in itself, but slipping fast. The figures, presiding officer, were worse in the same period last year, things are not improving, they are not even staying the same, they are getting worse. Now we all know there are a few key reasons for this, they are well discussed both in this chamber, in private meetings and in meetings with all the health stakeholders. This was why it was even more surprising that Friday's press release from the SNP sought to see off Scottish Labour's proposal for a frontline fund to ease pressure in our hospitals by announcing yet another review and the Cabinet Secretary buying herself another six months before she takes some action. Because the frontline fund is simply SNP policy. It's the right thing to do. Both these benches and the government benches know it. We have the government's policy papers on seven-day hospital services, evening diagnostics, weekend surgery and round-the-clock discharge. But for some reason, the Cabinet Secretary wants to wait another six months before she lets it happen. And we saw again today that reflected in John Swinney's budget. The money announced is money that has simply been announced over the past few weeks. The £29 million that he said was additional is not actually, but it was health consequentials that were already sitting there. Now, this task force was put on the back burner. Could it be that it was put on the back burner during the referendum? Because... It was, well, the, the Cabinet Secretary laughs, but the evidence bears this out. It was press released in October 2013, and despite the paper saying it was going to meet every two months, um, I haven't received an answer to my PQs on if this task force has met at all. Not much seems to have happened. Yes. General Robertson. 
I, I astounded. The task force has met every two months. The PQ is being answered today. It has met every two months. I think she really ought to move away from the conspiracy theories and let the people who are on the task force get on with the very good work that they are doing. Anymara? I'm glad that the Cabinet Secretary was able to clarify that for me today. She wasn't able to answer th that question when I put the same question to her last week. Presiding officer, yesterday Jim Murphy and I witnessed at first hand <laughs> the difference that seven day services would make. At Monklands Hospital, the, the A and E consultant talked us through the chart that so showed a significant peak into the... No, I think I'd like to make some progress, if that's OK. I think you should in your remaining minute. Remaining minute. Thank you, presiding officer. The difficulty they face on a Monday when discharges are not made at the weekend, so beds are at a premier, premium when they're most needed on a busy Monday. Presiding officer, there was no new money in John Swinney's budget today for frontline services and I ask the Chamber to consider. I'm happy to take an intervention from the Health Secretary if she'd like to go Senator again. Robinson. I just wonder if Jenny Mara wouldn't have a bit of self-awareness of the fact that she's talking about an A&E visit that she and her party wanted to close. Will she not congratulate us for keeping it open so that her and Jim Murphy had the pleasure of visiting the excellent <laughs> facilities at Monday? In, in your remaining 10 seconds. Presiding officer, there is no new money in today's budget for frontline services in the NHS. I think the Health Secretary knows as well as I do how desperate this situation is and that they need to invest. Many thanks. Now call on Linda Fabiani to be followed by Willie Rennie. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I have to say, I, I was quite stunned yesterday to see photographs of Jim Murphy standing outside Monklands a and &E. I'm even more stunned today to hear that Jenny Mara um, thought it was worth raising that in the chamber today. Because I remember in Lanarkshire fighting an election a couple of years ago, an awful lot of it being based on Labour Party's proposals to close a and es But to me, it just sums up what the Labour Party under their new leadership and regime are doing right now, which is let's find an issue, any issue, and have a go with absolutely no self-awareness of the role they played in creating the problem in the first place. And can I suggest that some kind of collective memory kicks in before this goes even further? Because, let me tell you, the people of Scotland are not fooled. They're rolling about their living rooms right now, <laughs> listening to all the machinations of the Labour Party, not least that all of a sudden the Labour Party are going to make sure we get more powers for Scotland? Well, my goodness, if the Labour Party had been true to that over the last few years, perhaps we wouldn't be having the wrangles over the Smith Commission and the rolling back from it that the Labour Party and the Conservative Party and the Lib Dems and their wee partnership have been doing over the last few years and really sticking up for Scotland. It's the same when I listen to, to Jackie Bailey's analysis of John Swinney's um, opening debate today. There was nothing at all there that said, do you know what? We actually agree with you that equality and fairness should be at the heart of everything we do. We actually agree with you that you should be boosting our small businesses to try and overall improve our economies improve our communities. We actually agree with you that education is really, really important for our children. Yes. Jackie Bailey. I am, I am very grateful to Linda Fabiani, who I don't often disagree with in the chamber, but on this point, um, she clearly wasn't listening. I talked about education as being a key tool in tackling inequality and the importance of education. Will she therefore revise her comments? Uh, no, I won't preside an officer because Jackie Bailey belongs to the same party that's currently paying off teachers in Glasgow. Redu sorry, re maybe I'll take back paying off, reducing teachers in numbers in Glasgow, raising class sizes. She's in the same party as those that are running South Lanarkshire that haven't even got their budget through because the SNP group 
are saying they shouldn't be increasing class sizes and reducing teacher numbers. So perhaps the Labour Party should get together and talk about their vision for this country instead of being all over the place the way they are. They should start welcoming the fact that um, an A&E was kept open in Lanarkshire and that therefore the situation with bed blocking and patient flow isn't nearly as bad as it might have been if the Labour Party had had their own way. Welcome the fact that extra funding has been put in to tackle delayed discharge. Welcome the fact we're starting to have a joined up approach to social care and hospitalisation for our elderly. Welcome the fact that this government believes that education is so important for children that we are taking steps in this party to make sure that children, no child in Scotland should be unfairly disadvantaged because of the political machinations of whatever group happens to be running that area. Can I also suggest that perhaps welcoming the fact that we are trying to address fuel poverty and domestic energy efficiency, because that has been an ongoing issue for many, many years in this country. And most of all, could I perhaps ask that the Labour Party welcome the fact that some of the reduced budget that comes to Scotland is being spent on mitigation of welfare policies that are hammering people absolutely hammering people right across this country. I think, no thank you, I think we've heard enough from the Labour Party. They can't even welcome free education in the higher education sector. They can't even welcome free prescriptions, free medical attention at the point of need. So if the Labour Party has gone so far from their roots that hatred of the SNP is much more important to them and that they will scrabble about and talk about resilience funds, offices of budget responsibility, and some, I can't remember what they call the fund for the NHS, frontline fund for the NHS, but can't welcome and work together with some of the things that are happening, welcomed by civic society, that the Labour Party used to listen to, Maybe I was wrong what I said earlier. Maybe they shouldn't get together and talk to each other because it seems to me there's been far too much of that already. They should start to talk to the people of Scotland, find out why their support's going down the tubes and maybe join with those of us that really want to make it a better future. Thanks very much. Now call on Willie Rennie to be followed by John Mason. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The context of this budget is one of an economy in recovery. There are now 168,000 more jobs in Scotland since this UK government came to power. Employment is up more than ever before. GDP is up above the level from before the recession and unemployment is down. And we should remind ourselves that that is all based on a plan that those on the SNP benches and the Labour benches said would not work. And whilst the economy is in recovery, the NHS is in crisis. It's not a word I like to use frequently, but that is exactly how we have to describe the NHS as we see it today. And I have to say the remarks from John Swinney and Mark Macdonald showed a creeping level of complacency about what the NHS is facing just now. For those, not just now, for those who meet NHS workers on a regular basis, we understand that the enormous pressures that they are under just now, partly through demographic changes, but also partly because the SNP took their eye off the ball during the referendum. They were distracted by their obsession with independence, and as a result, we are seeing the price that has been paid by our hospitals. So as I say, I do not look, like to use, not just now, I do not like to use the word crisis, but there is no doubt that after we have seen the figures on A and E waiting times this week, where they have plunged below the level that is in England, that the NHS is in crisis, not just now. So what we, we also have seen, what is quite clear, is that the colleges are under extraordinary pressure as well. Part-time 
courses have been cut. Full time isn't quite full time anymore for college courses, just at a time when industry needs an increasing number of skilled workers. Class size targets have been missed, cancer waiting times have been missed, and on teacher targets, I have to say, to attack local government for this government's failure to meet its target, I think is below acceptable. All this has, all this has been seen, not just now, all this, all this means that what we have seen is at a time when we needed this government to focus on the big challenges that public services face, they have taken their eye off the ball to focus on independence, not just now. We have recommended, we have recommended a realistic costed set of proposals. And the Deputy First Minister knows that Liberal Democrats have taken a constructed, constructive and costed approach to the budget process in every single year. So when we oppose budgets, we don't oppose budgets on the basis of being opposed to what, everything that the SNP say. We will look at, at budgets on their own merit. That's the approach we have taken in the past. We supported the government when they increased funds for colleges when they increased funds for house building, when they made sure that two-year-olds, thousands of two-year-olds, were able to get 15 hours of nursery education each week, and when P1 to P3 in our primary schools were getting free school meals. On every single occasion, when they came up with proposals that met our ambitions, we supported them. So when we oppose, we don't just oppose for the sake of it, we oppose for realistic reasons. And our proposals this year, again, were realistic and costed. We wanted the NHS to get the investment that it needed, included, including for mental health. We wanted all the Barnet consequentials, unlike in previous years, to be transferred right over to the NHS. We also identified that funds from the Pharmaceutical Price Regulation Scheme, additional funds that the Scottish Government have received for that, should be spent on mental health. Our second recommendation was to make sure that childcare matched the level of support that two-year-olds are getting in England. 40% there, only 27% here. Two-thirds of the way there, but still a bit of a way to go, because we know that is the best educational investment that we can make. Our third was on student loan repayment thresholds. In England, in England graduates only start to repay their loans once they earn £21,000 a year. In Scotland, that figure is down to £16,950. We believe that that is a price that graduates cannot afford to pay and therefore we should be giving them the extra support. Mr Swinney, to his credit, has said that he is investigating the matter and we welcome future discussions about that matter. And then on colleges. Colleges have been at the forefront of the SNP's cuts in recent years. And we still, with this year's coming budget, we do not see it back up to the level that we had in 2011-12, when it was at £544 million. That's a big shortfall, and that's the price that students are paying as a result. So these were the reasonable tests that we set the SNP government this year for the budget. And I'm sorry to say they have not met the tests that we have set. So therefore, we will be unable to support them in this budget. They took their eye off the ball in the referendum. We have now seen the price that people are paying as a result Roger, of please. that. That is something that we believe is unacceptable, and that's why we will not be supporting the budget today. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call John Mason to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Hey, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I start off by very much welcoming the extra funding that the Cabinet Secretary has been able to provide, specifically £20 million for domestic energy efficiency, £10 million for teacher numbers, £15 million held back, which is not a huge sum of money, but I think it does send out a good signal as compared to the kind of profligate uh, Labour uh, government we had in the past at Westminster where they spent all they had and more. And I was somewhat surprised to hear Gavin Brown suggesting that we should be much more optimistic in what we think we're going to get in and spend it before we actually get it. Uh, I do think we should put on record the good management of the budget by John Swinney and the SNP government. Clearly, there have not been the opportunity to date to borrow and get into the kind of difficulties that uh, have been got into at Westminster. But what has been achieved has been capital projects staying very close to or sometimes coming in well below budget and projects that were in trouble when other people ran them, like the trams, getting sorted out when they were taken over. 
and revenue expenditure, it has to be said, staying remarkably close to the budget. And all of this, I think, bodes well for the future when we have more powers. If I can also mention some welcome projects in my own constituency. Uh, recently, Garrahill Primary School opened, uh, which is thanks to both the Scottish Government and Glasgow City Council. And also in the last month, we have seen the Games Village starting to be occupied by both owner-occupiers and tenants. This is great news for local folk as well as incomers and is certainly boosting the East End of Glasgow. So sometimes I think it's good that we remember past budget decisions when we are now beginning to see the fruit of them. If we want to emphasise more on outcomes rather than inputs, then it does require patience in all our parts to see that happen. We have discussed that all of this at the Finance Committee to some uh, extent, and it's touched on in paragraph 192 of the Committee report, and I do very much agree with the Government's comment uh, on that, which says the assessment of outcomes is complex. It is neither practical nor feasible to attribute each pound sing spent to a single outcome. In reality, most interventions, actions and activities will influence a whole range of outcomes. And I think that shows a kind of more mature approach to budgets which we need to move towards. I can also say I very much welcome the commitment to future funding, especially of affordable housing of £390 million, which I think is an increase of 21% over the current three-year period. Now, of course, when we look at budgets, we all have to accept that we make choices. And if there's going to be more for the NHS, then there has to be less for something else. And again, I do not think we've heard very much of that this afternoon. We can all see where money, more money could be spent. And for example, this week on Monday, I met representatives from the National Union of Students and discussed their concerns about the college bursary system, some students who are clearly struggling financially. By comparison, the higher education students seem to have more certainty earlier in the academic year what their income will be. And although it might be partly a question of uh, moving resources, there's also, I think, a question of the way resources are dispersed in the two sectors. But the main thing I wanted to speak about this afternoon was the block grant from Westminster, because clearly that remains a key part of the Scottish budget and is likely to remain so for some time to come, albeit being gradually reduced. If anyone was going to design a system for the UK from scratch, would it not be logical to decide the main UK-wide part of the budget first, and then each of the devolved administrations would build on that? So once we knew the block grant, the allowances and other rules around income tax, we would then set the bans and the rates. Once we know the UK VAT rates and expected income, we would then know how much we had to spend. Yet by contrast, we face the situation where with LBTT, the Scottish Government does a very thorough consultation, listens to a wide range of responses, sets its rates for some months ahead, although that had been criticised for being too short notice, and then, by contrast, the Westminster Government changes SDLT at a few hours' notice, with no consultation, and with the ludicrous scenes, such as house buyers or sellers being pulled off the golf course to make instant decisions to avoid tax. We have two fundamentally different styles of government here, presiding officer. One is trying to be inclusive, consultative and modern. The other is stuck in a traditional mindset and loves theatre over substance. My concern is that going forward, we are asking for trouble if this Parliament is expected to strengthen its fiscal framework. I have no problem with that. But is there a matching openness at Westminster to move into the 20th century and produce a budget like any modern organisation should? I fear the signs are not good. I did ask Danny Alexander, the Chief Secretary to Treasury at Finance Committee last week, about modernising Westminster. And I would have thought a Lib Dem would be open to that. But I fear I was not greatly encouraged by his response. He talked about it being easier administratively to change rates and bans than the likes of personal allowances. But is that really the basis of how the UK or Scotland should set its budget? Ease of administration? Surely it should be based on the major decisions being made first and then moving on to the finer detail, i.e. UK-wide decisions made first, Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland build on that. The Smith Commission report also talked about intergovernmental working. There's a very good quote on page five, which I probably don't have time to read out, but it does talk about the concern about needing a better relationship, greater respect between the two. But if we are going forward where broadly Scotland sets its budget first and then Westminster has the opportunity to play games and catch Scotland out, how can that be productive or mean greater respect? So in summary, I'm very happy to support this budget at stage three. Looking forward, we are likely to face more complex budgets in the future. A major factor will be what actual powers this Parliament is given. But another major factor will be the attitude of Westminster. 
Do they want the UK to work better, or do they want to build up tensions which will cause problems in future? We shall see. Thank you. I now call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Uh, presiding officer, this is a historic uh, day when we're setting uh, budget uh, uh, tax rates for the coming year as well as uh, hearing from the government uh, what they're going to spend the money on. So I think it's appropriate to spend uh, some of the debate uh, on that first issue. I don't actually dissent from the decisions that the Cabinet Secretary made about uh, LBTT, but I do share some of the concerns that Gavin Brown voiced about uh, our understanding of this tax and given this is the first of many devolved taxes we're to have I do think it's important that we have clarity and transparency I think Gavin Brown had perhaps been reading the same Bill Jameson article about uh, this uh, in which Bill Jameson said firstly that few acronyms are more calculated to empty a room these days than LBTT and then he went on to say MSPs can be excused utter bafflement as to how much LBTT will actually uh, raise and perhaps the cabinet Secretary and his wind-up will give some answers on that. I think the problem really does rise in the shifting uh, meaning of revenue uh, neutrality. As Gavin Brown pointed out on the 9th of October, it was raising no more or less than the taxes they replace. Uh, when I questioned the Cabinet Secretary and Committee last week, he said it, would be, it was enough to cover the block grant adjustment and his letter of the 22nd of January to the Finance Committee said the same but on the very same day in the Chamber the First Minister said revenue neutrality was enough to uh, cover the block grant adjustment and put money into the cash reserve. So I think we're all still utterly baffled so if an explanation could come in the wind up I think it would be serve the interests uh, of transparency although no doubt most of us after the explanation will be asking the Cabinet Secretary to explain explain his explanation. Moving on to the spending, I think it's never been uh, uh, more clear or consistent uh, in terms of the demands coming from uh, the Labour Party. There are three. They are the same as they were at stage one. Briefly, uh, £1 million. Uh, the Scottish Government could, should consider the option of, of inviting the F, uh, Scottish Fiscal Commission to produce the official macroeconomic and fiscal forecast for Scotland. That, by the way, is not uh, words from the Labour Party, but from the Finance Committee. So clearly, this whole issue about forecasting has been put on the agenda by the Finance Committee and Labour is merely articulating that at a specific budget request, which does not uh, amount cost a, a great deal of money. The second demand is the resilience fund, not an oil fund, but an emergency fund to help areas affected by job losses. I don't really see how anybody could argue against that. I haven't really heard the arguments of the Scottish Government against that, but clearly they're not minded to accept that request. And then, of course, the third and major demand from the Labour Party today is the front line uh, fund for the NHS and in the uh, stage one debate I pointed out that this was merely uh, implementing what was um, government policy because they also uh, support uh, seven day services and I quoted from the seven day services position paper of the Scottish Government which says two very interesting things which back up what Labour is demanding. Firstly it says there may be some uh, 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 actions that could be taken immediately that would result in a rapid improvement in patient care so that's prior to the reporting of the task force which has been meeting on this subject for rather a long time now. And then among the various suggestions, there was one called spread elective surgery, which is what Labour is asking for. And the, 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 the position paper of the Scottish Government said there is an argument that spreading elective surgery over more days to avoid the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday congestion, which of course Jenny Murray referred to, would help both scheduled and unscheduled care. So it does seem to me that from the very arguments of the government we can justify the position that we have put forward in the budget. Of course you have to make hard choices in the budget. It doesn't mean we don't support the objectives that Linda Fabiana outlined but we have to choose and clearly the health service having had a long period of steady progress has uh, in many respects started to go uh, into reverse and that's something that we have to uh, respond to. That's been uh, focused uh, a great deal of the time on the... I give way. Bruce Crawford. I, I, I'm just looking, seeking for clarity. I may have missed it, and forgive me, Malcolm Chisholm, if I did miss it, but I'm pretty sure in stage one that Jackie Bailey also suggested that we should, should be more money for local government, but I've not heard you restate that in your position today. Is that position of, lab, of Labour or is it not? 
Malcolm Chisholm. did not say that today, and that's not the correct interpretation of what you said at stage one either. So we have to respond to the crisis, Order, which is, which is the, the barometer of the problems, of course, is what's happening in A&E, but very close related to the, the, the big increase in, the, in, in bed days occupied by delayed discharge patients. Now, I'm never, never uh, unkind to the Cabinet Secretary for Health, but the Herald, of course, had a cartoon of a man, I think it was a man, in a bed uh, with a delayed discharge, and the hospital manager was saying to the patient, don't worry, the Health Secretary has a long-term plan. So reviews are good, but it's my last minute, it's my last minute. Can I take an intervention? Well, we're rather tight for time, it would need yes, to be a quick I'm, one. I'm sorry, I, I never like being unkind to you, but I have to be because the, because the presiding officer tells me to be. So um, I think reviews are good, but there is an urgency about what's required. Now, on the delayed discharge money, which is... Um, which she has uh, announced. Can I make one uh, final point? Although I would have liked to know more about the performance uh, fund, by the way, which was what I was trying to intervene on the Cabinet Secretary uh, in his speech. Perhaps he can explain how the performance fund will be distributed uh, in his wind-up speech. But on the delayed discharges, in principle, these, that should be distributed according to the formula. Um, but I would argue on a one-off basis that the delayed discharge fund should be distributed on the basis of those who have the biggest problem currently with delayed discharge. And that would be uh, my final um, point that, I want, that I'm able to make in my speech today. Thank you very much. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Ian Gray. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I welcome this opportunity to support the 2015-16 uh, Budget Bill. Scotland has made clear its desire to have more uh, powers devolved to the Scottish Parliament since the Smith Commission reported and the UK Command paper was published uh, just last week. Indeed, a YouGov poll on Monday found support for Scottish independence at a record high of 53%. So it seems that the Scottish people share the SNP view that the Smith Commission uh, proposals are a watered-down version of the panicked promises made just before the referendum. And even Gordon Brown seems to be riding on the SNP's coattails, claiming that the Smith Commission was too weak Interestingly, the comments made by Mr Brown in last November sang a different tune in which he expressed grave concerns about devolving control of income tax to the Scottish Parliament. Now his previously expressed concerns about devolving tax control to Holyrood take a back seat to the need for Labour's uh, urgency for naked political survival uh, three months uh, tomorrow. After five years in power, there are no signs that the UK government has any intention of loosening the noose of austerity from the neck of the UK economy. And recall that only last month uh, Labour voted with their Tory pals for a further £30 billion in cuts. Such an approach has been condemned by several leading economists. Oliver Blanchard, chief economist of the International Monetary Fund and MIT professor, claimed that the Conservative Party leadership are playing with fire and continuing to pursue austerity policies. Additionally, a report published by the London School of Economics professor and advisor to the European Commission, Paul de Graw, said that a unilateral application of austerity policies is not only ineffective in resuscitating the economy, but it more often than not leads to greater state problems such as civil unrest. If last week's success, success of Saritza in Greece has taught us anything, is that people will ultimately have their say in the budgetary actions of the state. And in a statement published by the Office of Budget Responsibility and Future UK Spending, the OBR announced that, and I quote, between 2009-10 and 2019-20, and spending on public services, administration and grants by central government is projected to fall from 21.2% to 12.6% of GDP and from £5,650 to £3,880 per head in 2014-15 prices. This cut of almost a third of public spending will impact mainly on low-income families with wealthy recipients, low-paid workers and pensioners bearing most of the, gr the brunt. Now, Labour has, has fundamentally contradicted itself time and again, claiming to have Scottish interests at heart while voting for policies detrimental to Scotland and the Scottish people, particularly those most vulnerable to public spending cuts. And as a, gov as a government, it is imperative that the, the SNP government use the economic levers that they do have to tackle inequality. And that's why I'm delighted that in the 2015-16 budget bill, uh, we will deliver a welfare reform mitigation of £81 million. 
The Cabinet Secretary's Land and Building Transaction Tax and Scottish Landfill Tax will encourage first-time home buyers, stimulating house building and working synergistically with the additional £125 million investment in affordable housing. And my view differs somewhat from Gavin Brown's in terms of uh, the, the more expensive houses. I think that the, the tax level there will actually uh, serve to dampen house price inflation and ultimately save money even for the people who actually will be paying that additional taxation. The new rates uh, satisfy the principle of revenue neutrality laid out by Mr Swinney in October. And again, I disagree with Gavin on that. But in creating a system in which the first £145,000 of every residential pur purchase is tax-free, over 90% of transactions will pay the same or less in taxes on the new homes than under current UK arrangements, as the Cabinet Secretary pointed out. The Scottish Government is, of course, committed to increasing employment and promotes a burgeoning Scottish economy. And at a time when Scotland has unemployment rates below that for the UK as a whole, I was delighted that this budget will enhance uh, uh, employment by providing £16.6 million to support youth employment through uh, the Commission on Scotland's Young Workforce. And this budget invests in the public sector, boosting, as we've heard, the NHS by an additional £383 million. So in contrast to George Osborne's austerity measures that are crippling local government in England, the Scottish Government has delivered a fair settlement for local authorities, enabling the delivery of shared priorities such as education, free school meals and childcare. And we note no uh, uh, calls from the opposition parties for additional spending in those areas. The bill demonstrates the Government's commitment to tackling inequality, uh, with over £100 million committed to delivering the living wage and implementing a two-year public sector pay policy, which increases the minimum uplift for those earning less than £21,000 a year. And a variety of investments outlined in the budget demonstrate the government's effort to support a more prosperous Scotland and measures to improve opportunities at all stages in life, such as £160 million invested into early learning and childcare. Uh, and uh, we'll see, as, as uh, John Mason uh, touched on, an extra £20 million in delivering energy efficiency. Uh, £615 million is being invested to provide the most competitive business taxes in the UK and almost a £1 billion pounds invested in capital projects through the non-profit distribution model. This budget bill uh, is a testament to the SNP's ability to act prudently within the constraints set by UK Government in terms of the devolution of powers and Tory austerity measures sadly supported by Labour. In short, presiding officer, this budget augments the Scottish economy, boosts employment, tackles inequality and invests in public services. And we compare that to Labour's irresponsible shopping list. We heard about the 100 million. A figure, to my mind, seems to be plucked from thin air. It doesn't have any detail behind it that I've been able to see. Uh, I, I, no detail of where that money is to come from. But if we look at other recent Labour statements on the 29th of December, Kezia Dugdale suggested 100,000 new homes be built in Scotland. Whatever happened to the legendary Glasgow Airport rail link? And Jackie Bailey said on the 12th, on the 12th of November, Draw £50 close, million pounds is a small amount of money to pay to cancel Scotland's care tax. So whatever happened to that, I wonder if Ms Bailey could perhaps tell us. They're all over the place on this budget, so I'm pleased that we have a, a, a responsible and prudent Scottish Government that actually can deliver a sensible budget for the people. Thank Scotland. you very much. Ian Gray to be followed by Sandra White. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer. Our uh, focus in uh, this budget debate, and indeed in the whole budget process this year, has been around health and the NHS, and there are good reasons uh, for that. It is the single uh, biggest uh, component of the Scottish Government's budget. Uh, it is also currently the most urgent in need of attention, given the uh, stories of crisis which we regularly read or hear, particularly around accident and emergency uh, and bed blocking. But it's a natural thing for us to do too, because it was Labour who created the National Health Service. It is the thing of which we are most proud, and we will always defend it first and foremost. Uh, so uh, uh, that has been uh, our focus. But if Labour's uh, proudest achievement is universal health care, then Scotland's proudest achievement in public services is universal education, almost 500 years since the predecessor to this parliament first enacted the famous school in every parish legislation. So it's also right that we judge this budget uh, on its uh, record, and not just this budget, but uh, the Scottish Government's record uh, through home state budgets now uh, uh, in the sense in which they have supported uh, education. And the story, as with health, is really that much was promised, uh, but little has been delivered. And in that, this budget is one more chapter. Indeed, if you listen to Mr Swinney's uh, opening, you would imagine uh, that the Scottish Government had delivered on their promises uh, 
on schools education, that they had sustained teacher numbers, uh, and that basically everything uh, was right. But of course, nothing could be further from the truth. In 2007, the SNP's promise was to maintain teacher numbers uh, as they were uh, at that time. In 2011, uh, their promise was that uh, they would look first to maintain the recent improvement before continuing with progressive reductions in class sizes and improved pupil-teacher ratios. The reality, of course, is that if we look at teacher numbers, uh, they uh, reduced in 2008, they reduced in 2009, they reduced in 2010, they went down in 2011, they went down in 2012, uh, down again in 2013 and dropped, of course, uh, as Mr Swinney himself mentioned, uh, last year in 2014. And we are now almost 4,500 teachers fewer uh, than when the SNP came to power. The story on pupil-teacher ratios uh, is the same. A a an improvement, yes, from 2007 to 2008, but every single year after that, uh, pupil-teacher ratios have worsened year on year. And as for the core promise of class sizes of 18 in primaries 1 to 3, when the SNP came to power, 15.3% uh, of pupils were in classes of 18 or less, P1 to 3. That's now 12.9% less. So in every one of these promises, the situation has worsened. And we begin to see now some of the effects, particularly of the loss of teachers, the delay in the introduction of new exams, uh, appeals being squeezed out, we saw last week, in order to save money for the SQA's central budget. This week, Murray Council suggesting they might have to close schools because they don't have enough teachers. The EIS uh, in front of our education committee saying that our schools are running on the goodwill of teachers and it cannot go on, and head teachers talking about the potential for total disaster. So clearly, clearly, we require some attention for education in this budget. Bruce Crawford across these points genuinely, but could you tell us just how much Labour would propose spending additionally in local government to support the issues she raises? Agree. Well, look, I'm talking about a situation which has taken eight years to develop. If you're suggesting that a single amendment to this budget could reverse that, I don't think that is possible. But I will, I will comment on the action which the Cabinet Secretary has taken today. Now, this year, the Cabinet Secretary told us when he introduced his budget he was going to bring forward educational outcome agreements with COSLA. They were going to be agreed in consultation with local authorities, parents and teachers. And I say to Linda Fabiani, that's something that I would welcome. But it does rather beg the question why after eight years the government is only now beginning to think about what outcomes they would like to see from our education system. But it also begs the question what was happening to those promises on sustaining teacher numbers. And the EIS in particular were quick to rumble that this was a cover uh, for abandoning those. And to be fair, the Cabinet Secretary responded to that by turning to his usual scapegoats, local government. First, he made local government an offer they could not accept, a, an amount of money which was nowhere near what would have been required to deliver what he was asking. So now, today, he has tried to make them an offer they cannot refuse. This is the man who used to boast in budgets of the concordats he signed with local councils, and now he is reduced to bragging about the ultimatum that he has issued to them. And the truth is this, that faced with the growing evidence from teachers, head teachers and councils, the local please. authorities do not have enough resources to sustain teacher numbers. His answer is to claw resources back. It's hard to see how that will do anything except accelerate the drop in teacher numbers for which he is already responsible. And what will he do with this money that he claws back? Perhaps he can add it to his own education department underspend, which stood at £165 million at the last count while our schools lack the resources they need. Draw the please. truth is, Deputy Presiding Officer, that, as always, this budget fails our education system, and it will be parents, teachers and pupils who pay the price. Thank you. And I call Sandra White to be followed by Patrick Harvey. 
Uh, thank you very much, presiding officer, and can I once again thank the Cabinet Secretary for his contribution and his announcements of extra revenues, particularly in the health service, energy efficiency, tackling fuel poverty, which I think is very, very important, uh, and particularly heating households, which obviously leads to ill health and inequalities also, and protecting and increasing teacher numbers. And if I can just say to Ian Gray, whose contribution I listened to very carefully, in the constituencies I represent in Glasgow Kelvin, is Glasgow City Council that is causing the problems with teacher numbers and class sizes. And I would really appreciate it if uh, you wish to speak or write to some of the parents of uh, Hillhead Primary School and the situation they find themselves in because of the situation with Glasgow City Council closing schools and not having a big enough school for the pupils. And it is an absolute disgrace. So you cannot blame this government for the, what's happening, particularly in my constituency, it's Glasgow City Council. The blame fully lies upon there. Yes, I can read. Ian Gray. I cannot seriously say that when the Scottish Government make promises to parents and when they then starve local government of the resources they would require to deliver those promises, that it's somehow not their fault. Thank you, mate. The Government didn't starve Glasgow City Council of any monies. Glasgow City Council took it upon themselves to build a school and basically didn't take cognizance of the evidence they got from parents that that school would be overprovided. Now they have an absolute mess where children can't even get into their local school. And that is being called in in Glasgow City Council, thanks to the Greens and the SNP group on that council. That blame is firmly at Glasgow City Council's door, and we will look into whatever's happening there. So it's not just the government, and you need to recognise that. Now, I've listened to the opposition on the health service, and the word crisis, well, Irene isn't here at the moment, the word crisis has been bandied about. It's as if you want to give bad news consistently to everyone to frighten people. We have fantastic people working in the health service. How do you feel you think they feel every single time the Labour Party, Lib Dems in particular, say that the NHS is in crisis, as if it's falling apart? It is not falling apart. I'll take Alec Rowley. I want to get some figures. Through. Alec Rowley. I was interested in Willie Rennie saying crisis. I had a phone call for a lady this morning, arrived at hospital in five, quarter to eight, due to go for a gallbladder operation, got prepped, saw the consultant, saw the anaesthetist, um, was sitting there in the bed clothes, ready to wait. And at 11 o'clock, was told to go home that her, her operation was cancelled. Is that acceptable? You. Sandra White. Thank, thank you very much. I don't think it is acceptable. I'm sure if you wanted to write to the Cabinet Secretary, she would look into that individual case. I don't cover the Fife area. I cover Glasgow area. I did answer, Mr Gray. If you just let me, Order, let me carry on, please. I wanted to let you know about the news, the good news of the health service. And I talk to people in my area too, patients, doctors, consultants and nurses also, and they're not all saying it's in crisis. Now, let's look at some of the figures here. NHS consultant numbers are at a record level, 36.8% increase and over 1,300 more WTE consultants since 2006. Overall, NHS staffing is up 7.6%. The number of qualified nurses and midwives is at a record high. The number of NHS consultants, medical and, very importantly, dental, which sometimes gets overlooked, is at a record high. The number of GPs is up 5.7%. Senior managers, which so can I just finish this one, Jackie? Se senior, sorry, Jackie Bailey. Senior managers are down 29.3 percent, which is something people always called upon. We want people there at the coal face, not just at the manage managerial level. Uh, Jackie Bailey, take Jackie Bailey. Sandra White for taking the intervention. Would she accept that vacancies are also up and posts are vacant for much longer? And what we're seeing in the NHS is more people being treated and actually demand outstripping the number of staff that are available. 
Sandra White. I think it's a good thing that more people are being treated. And the reason that you're saying there's vacancies are up, we're actually having more staff. So obviously more people are applying for jobs. I think that can only be a good thing. It's not that the, the NHS is deteriorating or it's in crisis. It's actually the impression that the opposition parties are giving to the people out there. And I think it's, it's a dangerous thing to do. And it's disingenuous, not just to the people out there, but to the staff that work in the NHS as well. And for that, I think we should really think very, very carefully. I, I mean, someone else, I think it might have been Gavin, that said, basically, why don't we work together? And that's what we've been trying to do. We have listened to people throughout, not just the various parties, but, but throughout the, the country as well. And we're trying to put forward a budget, and I think John Swinney has put forward a very sensible budget. But when you're constantly talking about the NHS in crisis, falling apart, when I've just read out the figures of the increase in the staff that we've got in the NHS, well, I do think it's rather disingenuous and it does frighten the people out there. I'm not saying that's what the opposition parties are trying to do. I would not never say that, but I do think people need to sit and think about it very, very carefully in that respect. I support the budget when the decision time comes, uh, presiding officer. I would think and hope that other parties, other opposition parties, would think very carefully about not supporting the budget. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And I now call Patrick Harvey to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, this budget, like several recent budgets, takes place in a, a context in which we see continual pressure on public services, uh, particularly those at local government level, and continual public sector pay cuts in real terms, uh, even if uh, the, there have been moves to ameliorate that at the, the lowest end of the uh, of the wage scale. We're also discussing a budget in the context of continual challenges in meeting the targets that we've all signed up to on issues from climate change to fuel poverty, uh, and uh, in particular, uh, a recognition that energy and transport uh, are areas where both of those, uh, those issues, uh, in terms of social justice and environmental uh, priorities, uh, are not making enough progress. But at the same time, uh, we see the, the, a crisis which could be turned into an opportunity in, in the energy sector. And yet we're seeing from the Scottish Government continual appeals to the UK Government for tax breaks, for more fossil fuel exploration. That'll only dig us deeper into the hole that we're in, leave our economy ever more exposed to the vulnerability of the carbon bubble, when we could be looking to a new energy future, one based much more on renewables and on public and community ownership. Uh, in that context, we've continued to ask the Scottish Government, for example, what budget will be associated with the new body Wave Energy Scotland. And last week, uh, the Cabinet Secretary, the Deputy First Minister, I beg your pardon, uh, said that the, there will be money allocated from within the energy budget to that, and we still don't know what the figure is. I hope that there can be some greater clarity. In addition to those issues of context, we put several issues onto the, the agenda for discussion with the Scottish Government. Energy efficiency is by no means a new topic for the Greens uh, in the, the context of budget negotiations, but it's one where we still believe not enough progress has been made. The Cabinet Secretary has talked about an increase from £94 million announced at stage one, an increase of an additional 20. That, of course, is welcome. Steps in that direction are welcome. But I would have to say that it remains short of what the uh, NGOs, which are specialists in this sector, have been calling for as the bare minimum, the bare minimum annual spend. And even if it was uh, you know, just a question of, of the figures, because you know, these, these discussions each year, it, it would be wrong for them to end up merely as horse trading. We should be taking a coherent approach to this issue and conducting an assessment of what is actually needed to reach the targets that all political parties have signed up to. The Economy, Energy, Tourism Committee recommended that. They've called for a full cost analysis of what it will take uh, to reach the statutory target on fuel poverty. That hasn't happened. And so it's difficult to know. It's difficult to know how much closer that extra 20 million will take us to this crucial target, both in terms of the, the social justice and environmental goals that we set ourselves when we all agree on those targets. Uh, we've also had uh, a notion of an additional £4 million uh, on cycling. Uh, and again, 
not just as a, a regular cyclist, but as someone who wants to see a transformation of our transport system uh, toward a more sustainable model, uh, that's got to be a step in the right direction. The, dep the Deputy First Minister said that there'll be more information coming uh, later about how that's going to be deployed. And it will have uh, some positive steps. I'm sure some good will be done with that four million. It doesn't yet represent a concerted shift in transport policy, and that, I believe, is what's needed, not only in terms uh, of uh, an e a transport system that allows uh, money to circulate within local economies, that strengthens the resilience of local economies within Scotland, but also does it within environmental limits uh, and saves people money. Uh, it, it's also not clear yet what additional measures are going to be taken in terms of the air pollution, which is particularly acute, arising from transport in certain parts uh, of Scotland. And again, that's something that we'd uh, argued within the same context of, of sustainable transport and air pollution. Finally, we also argued that uh, on a smaller scale in, in, in budgetary terms, there was going to be a need for local authorities to be able to build their skills and capacity in relation to unconventional gas, uh, fracking and other techniques uh, if those applications were going to come through. Well, in the light of the moratorium that's been announced, and which is very much welcome, uh, it's clear that that is not such an urgent priority, although we will reserve the right to return to that uh, issue if that moratorium is ever lifted and if local authorities do find themselves uh, burdened with the, the, the threat of unconventional gas applications, we will need to scale them up if they're going to deal with that uh, it, adequately. But I would argue, and I've put this to the Cabinet Secretary, that every bit the same kind of opportunity exists from a small investment at local authority level to add skills in relation to renewable energies. The opportunity for every local authority to build up a local energy company which can not only contribute to the energy needs cleanly uh, in our country, but can generate revenues for itself in future. That's something where we're, I think we're missing a trick. And partly, the barrier is simply one of skills. Local authorities not having people who know what needs to be done to get underway on that. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary may have decided that today is more of a day for taking what I'm sure he regards as a robust approach with local government rather than an empowering one. I would encourage him to look at that as an opportunity. I had been hoping to give three cheers uh, on these three main themes that we'd raised. Uh, I, th I think I might even have been willing to settle for two. It seems that there's maybe one and a half, uh, and so I think I may reserve my position at the end of the day when we come to the vote. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. And I now call Bob Doris, who will be followed by Alec Rowley. Um, thank you very much, President Officer. It's often said that politics is about spending priorities. And if true, it is undeniable that the Scottish Government has prioritised health spending once more for the financial year 2015-2016. It's worth putting on record the significant cash uplift that NHS has had under this SNP Government. In the five years up to and including the budget we are seeking parliamentary approval for today, the NHS will have a real terms increase of 4.6%. That should be contracted, contrasted directly with the Scottish resource budget that has been slashed by the UK Government by 10% in real terms. That clearly shows Scottish Government priorities. Let me make some progress then, maybe later, Ms Bailey. With all Barnet consequentials from health spending having been given to our NHS and each and every year as promised, with commitment now extended to the entire lifetime of the next Scottish Parliament, should the SNP government be re-elected in 2016, and with the NHS funds now sitting at over £12 billion in 2015-16 alone, the Scottish government's commitment to our NHS is self-evident for all to see, Ms Bailey. Jackie Bailey. Would he agree that, therefore, between 2007 and 2010, when a UK Labour government gave the Scottish NHS inflation-busting increases, that actually the SNP didn't pass those on to the health service? Bob Doris. I'd ask Ms Bailey maybe just to sit tight for a second, because don't worry about contrasting the NHS in 2006-07 when Labour were last in power with its condition today. And can I assure you, when I get to that, Ms Bailey, it's far superior today than when you were last in power. Um, so I would like to think the Scottish Government commitment is self-evident to financially uh, backing our NHS. And I would hope this commitment could be accepted across the party political divide and the new conversation we could have in relation to the NHS is a constructive fashion about how best to spend record levels of financial support. That's the chat 
that we should be having. And this budget will ensure £173 million additional funding by the Scottish Government to support the delivery of health and social care integration. Supporting it today will achieve that. It will also help sustain the huge increase in staffing we have seen under this Scottish Government, compared, I have to say, to Ms Bailey's Government when they were last in power. So, as we have heard, that does mean 1,300 more consultants in the NHS. It does mean more than 1,700 full-time equivalent nurses in the NHS than under the last Labour Government. But actually, that does not go far enough, because it is not just about nurses and doctors. It is about pharmacists, allied health professionals. It is about a range of social care staff that is required the right skills at the right place at the right, term, at the right time to deliver the NHS, the health and social care services that we wish to see. So no complacency, but it is important to point out the progress that has been made. This budget will also ensure that there is a commitment to maintain the progress made since 2007 in terms of delayed discharge in the NHS. I am delighted that a £15 million partnership deal supported by this budget will take real action in partnership with the NHS, the Scottish Government and, I have to say on this occasion, COSLA. I recently met with Robert Calderwood, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde Chief Executive, and he informed me that money has already been put to use in the city of Glasgow. There are now an additional 120 step-down care beds to better support older people who are clinically fit to leave hospital, but social care packages have yet to be put in place. That is the reality of additional, government by, uh, additional funding by this government on the ground in the city of Glasgow. Now, we all know about recent challenges in relation to delayed discharge, but again, let us go back to 2007 and let us get some perspective. Delayed discharge today has reduced by two-thirds compared to 2007, and the average delay is down 50 per cent. Short-term challenges, long-term progress under this government, supported financially over a sustained period of time, despite huge cuts from a UK government. This budget will also ensure that the first tranche of an additional £100 million over three years will also be invested specifically to enhance social care services. That money is aimed at ensuring medically fit patients can be more speedily discharged from hospital eh, where appropriate, with appropriate care packages put in place. It will also help deliver preventative actions, hopefully to avoid older, frail people ever getting to a &E in the first place. So let us get some context today with the budget and the commitment in relation to the National Health Service. Yes, we will always hear claims for more money. We heard on the 13th of January from Neil Finlay that it was West Lothian, not, not councils, just West Lothian Council, £108 million, I believe, was their shortfall. We have heard uh, from Jackie Bailey, I believe, to get rid of care charges at a price of £50 million. Joanne Lamont wanted to cap childcare costs. Spicy, that could cost up to £1 billion. We have heard an exposition from Ian Gray about more money, money for teachers, totally uncosted, without one commitment for one penny will come from. It takes this budget, this government, an SNP government, to balance the books, and despite huge austerity cuts from the UK, to prioritise our NHS. We have done that here this afternoon, and all I hear from others is empty promises. They will scurry about Scotland, promising everyone money for everything, but do nothing to stop UK austerity cuts coming from London, which they have signed up £30 billion to do to win right-wing votes in the south east of England. I know where I would stand with in this budget, and it is not the opposition party over there, and it is not Mr Murphy. Murphy is John Swinney, our Deputy First Minister, and I commend this budget to the House this afternoon. Thank you. I now call Alec Rowley to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I certainly would not be able to support this budget today because I think it fails on a whole range of fronts that need to be tackled. Um, if I can refer to Sandra White earlier and talking about you know, the, the, the commitment to the NHS and somehow talking the NHS down, I would certainly say that, that from my own personal experience, my family's experience, um, the NHS has been there and we could never repay um, what the NHS has done for our family and our families up and down Scotland and every community that would say the same. But that does not mean that we don't question 
the, you know, the, the, the NHS was the greatest creation of the last century, and in this century, as politicians, regardless of what party you're in, we have a duty to stand up and fight and make the case for the NHS. I mentioned to Sandra White about the case of the lady this morning with the cancelled operation. I understand, or she, she suggested to me, there was 10 cancellations this morning. I will be taking that up with the Health Secretary when I meet with her tomorrow. I will be calling for an inquiry into NHS 5 practice where another patient has died. Um, we saw the accident and emergency uh, time, waiting times that came out yesterday with NHS 5. Again, they were not acceptable. And the point is that Mr Swinney comes along here today and tells us that pa patient satisfaction is up, um, cleaning is up, accident emergency figures are up. Um, he, so it is a bit like the Emperor's clothing. We would expect the health service to be improving, but where it's not and where in the case of Fife it's bouncing, bouncing from crisis to crisis, then we need to be able to, as elected politicians, speak up for that. Um, but I also want to touch on a number of other points in the way, not, not just now, sorry, and a number of other points. Mr Swinney talks about a fairer um, society and that the economic strategy is working, but that is one of the major failures of this budget, is that it is failing to ensure that everyone can enjoy the benefits in Scotland of a stronger economy. 160,000 people that are presently unemployed in Scotland, they are certainly not reaping the benefits. Many more that are not registered as unemployed but are out of work and with no skills, not able to be able to get access to jobs that are there. We see, um, in my own constituency, we see um, pods being built in Recife and elsewhere to house workers coming from abroad, and employers tell me they can't get the skills locally, whilst at the same time we have seen a 37 per cent cut in college budgets since 2007, some £67 million. Pounds. So that, for me, does not equate to some kind of fairness or give way. Bob Doris. Thank you very much, Mr Riley. As others have said, I don't doubt the sincerity of, of, of Labour speeches. It's merely the fact there has to be a budget agreed, ag agreed this afternoon. Tell me, how much money is the Labour opposition pledging for Scotland's colleges? Is it costed? How many places? Can you deliver it? Or is it a soundbite just to garner favour with whoever you're talking to at any given time? What we, what we put forward today was £100 million for the National Health Service because we are saying that that is a key priority. In my case, in Fife, there is clearly a crisis within the National Health Service. £67 million taken out of the colleges over the last seven or eight years will not be put back in one budget. And that's the point that Ian Gray made. And I have to say, I have to say to the Deputy um, First Minister that, that I am absolutely appalled at the attack that he makes today on local government. Um, right across Scotland, local authorities, and he knows this, local authorities are are absolutely struggling in terms of the budgets that they are actually trying to deal with. In education, in Fife case, for example, um, the deputy leader advises me that they've got uh, faced with a bill at the end of last year for some £3.5 million for pension costs. There are many other costs that are there, and in every local authority, Councils are looking at cutting education budgets. There's no doubt about that. Now, I had always taken the Cabinet Secretary and the Deputy uh, First Minister at his word where he said he wanted to work with councils, but today he comes into this chamber and tries to politicise the relationship between local government and Scottish government, not recognising the major problems that local authorities are facing. When it comes to local government finance, year on year there has been real-term cash cuts in local government. The council tax freeze has not been properly funded, and as a result of that, we have seen cuts taking place in frontline services, and it is absolutely difficult to see how um, education will be able to um, continue with the level of services that they have with the types of budget cuts that, that are there at the present time. So certainly the offer that Mr Swinney makes today to talk to individual councils, I certainly would hope that the council in my area, in 
Council leaders and education spokespersons across Scotland are knocking on Mr Swinney's door and coming and presenting the facts to him. I hope that they also will be able to present the facts to the public. We must move away from this phony war between local government and the Scottish Government where the Teflon um, Cabinet Secretary and, and, and um, Deputy First Minister is prepared to blame local government but not prepared to take responsibility. Our teachers, our parents, but most importantly our children who are coming through the school system and can't get the jobs within the economy are not enjoying a share in the wealth of the Scottish economy. They Consequence, deserve better, please. far better. Thank you very much. And before we turn to closing speeches, I now call Bruce Crawford as our last open debate speaker. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm glad to get the opportunity to contribute to this Stage 3 debate on the Scottish Government's Budget Bill. Uh, setting a budget can be a difficult and challenging enough task when the backdrop is a budget allocation growing in real terms. You'll need to talk to Labour finance ministers to find out just how challenging a job that was, even in these circumstances. However, setting the budget in the teeth of a reduction of about 10% and the spending power available to you since 2010 does make budget setting substantially more challenging. Particularly at the same time, you are trying to help stimulate growth in the economy, create a fairer society and improve public services. The primary aim in any budget must be the goal of improving economic prosperity, because without such conditions it will prove even more difficult to support our vital public services. Of course, any government with the full normal fiscal levers available at its disposal would start with a significant advantage in attempting to help stimulate an investment-led recovery. But given that the Finance Secretary does not enjoy such a position, we must judge him on how he uses the tools he does have available at his disposal. So in doing so, I am glad that in setting his budget, John Swinney's infrastructure investment programme will now be worth over £8 billion over two years with a further £1 billion extension to the NPD infrastructure pipeline. Yeah, yeah. With key infrastructure projects, including obviously the fourth replacement co crossing, costing about £1.4 billion and directly uh, contributing at peak about 1,200 jobs, and new South Glasgow hospitals, costing £842 million and supporting 1,500 jobs in sight. And of course, Scotland's Schools for the Future Building programme, which will deliver 91 new schools by March 2018, and an additional £140 million provided to deliver two new college campuses. These are the very type of infrastructure projects that will help drive the economy forward, create jobs and improve prosperity of Scotland. And in that respect, I cannot help but reflect on the pre-recession period before 2008, when financial resources were much more freely available. In some respects, I regret that governments did not at that time commit a larger share of expenditure to infrastructure improvement. Had that been the case, I believe that our economy would have proved much more resilient to economic shock than the reality we all know. But that is obviously a retrospective position, and we cannot go back and undo the past. But perhaps, however, we can learn from the lessons that history teaches us in that regard. And that's why I'm pleased that today the Finance Secretary is utilising all of the re revenue spending room that he can potentially apply to get finance into much needed infrastructure spend. I'm also pleased today he's announced additional £20 million for energy efficiency measures, not only to help reduce fuel poverty, but also our climate change footprint on the planet. And also because, crucially, Scotland's only glass wool insulation production facility is located in my constituency of Stirling, yeah, yeah. in the shape of the firm Superglass. Uh, this company has had significant trading challenges as a result of negative changes to the UK government's Green Deal programme. I hope, in how the spend is deployed, uh, that the excellent quality of product produced by Superglass will be borne in mind as we try to develop the budget process in that regard, particularly if we can consider that in Scotland there are still a significant number of homes that remain to have appropriate levels of loft insulation installed. Now, I want to turn in the time I've got left to the position of the Labour Party uh, to the budget. Mm -hmm. um, during the stage one debate, and today during stage three, Labour spokespersons have put forward arguments that the budgets for both health and local government 
should see more resources applied to them, um, plus a resilience fund of some sort. Um, I've got this right. It's specifically £100 million added to the health budget, a less specific amount to local government. Um, Malcolm Chisholm, Ian Gray, Alec Rowley, none of them were ever able to put on a sum of exactly how much they were going to commit to local government in future. They're obviously not as brave as Jackie Bailey, though, uh, because from Jackie Bailey said at stage one, she'd like to see an additional £1.8 billion provided to councils or anything up to that sum. Now, I see Jackie Bailey shaking her, her head as if that's not uh, the fact. Uh, but if you, if you happen to go to columns 31 to 33 of the official report, yeah. you, oh, yes, I'm delighted to take your answer. Jackie Bailey. That, that indeed is very kind of the member, but if he reflected on what the official report says, the £1.8 billion is the amount that the SNP have removed from local government. Yeah. Chris Crawford. And interestingly, you've, you've not suggested today that we put one penny back into, into that, if that figure was to be correct. Now, the report says, First Minister asking a question, I have a simple question for Jackie Bailey. I'm hearing she Roger, wants to put, give more money to local government. I said the issue's too big. Two to be resolved. It absolutely is. And we're talking about £1.8 billion. Yes. So it's committed in paper that Jackie Bailey wants to put that number in. Yeah. A number that none of our people around about her were brave enough yeah, to man. put forward. Now, yeah. look, I fully I respect Labour's um, right to put forward proposals for additional expenditure. <laughs> That's the right of any party in this chamber. Even, even the figure of £1.8 billion for local government in the context of a fixed budget does seem quite extraordinary. But Labour, uh, in putting forward these proposals, have also got the responsibility to this Parliament and to the people of Scotland to identify which budgets will be cut by the equivalent amounts. It is no wonder that you are struggling in the polls. It's no wonder because you have shown absolutely no responsibility here in this budget process today and you're going to continue to suffer in the polls until you learn about what Josh, responsibility close, is all about. Thank you. I now turn to the closing speeches and I call on Murdo Fraser. Six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, Bruce Crawford made a, a fair point. Uh, I think Labour members do need something of a reality check. If they're going to pledge to spend more money, they need to say what other areas of the budget they should cut. But it's not just the uh, Labour members who need a, a, a reality check, if I may say so, because, of course, we've become used in these debates to hearing SNP members complain about the level of budget settlement received from the UK government, and today we heard Mark Macdonald and Kenny Gibson and others making just that point. The point I made in the stage one debate, and I make no apology for repeating it this afternoon, is that the reality is that this budget for 2015-16 is the highest we have ever had to deal with in this parliament in cash terms. And in real terms, it may not be the highest, but it is the second highest. Only in the year 2009-10 was the budget higher. And in each of the past 16 years, without one exception, the budget was lower. So when we hear SNP members talk about savage cuts or slashing to ribbons of the budget, we need to bear that in context. Indeed, for all the complaints about austerity, the Scottish Government has, in historic terms, huge sums to deal with, and today has given no indication of being a government that is having to count the pennies. Now, Gavin Brown raised the issue of business rates. We firmly believe that all the business-related consequentials coming up from the UK government spend should be passed on in rates reductions. Otherwise, the competitive advantage that Scottish businesses have, which we very much welcome, will be eroded. So the Scottish government should have been ensuring that the additional sums coming up from down south, to, for example, reflecting the support for retail premises that exists south of the border, were either mirrored in Scotland or passed on to business in some other way. And I make no apology for raising again the proposal from the Scottish Government to introduce rates on sporting interests, which will have a negative impact on the rural economy. But it, it is in relation to the rates on LBTT that we have the greatest disagreement with the Scottish Government. Now, Mr Brown has set out our proposed alternative approach to that being taken by Mr Swinney on LBTT. We believe that having a 10% rate kicking in at £325,000 will have an adverse effect on many individuals who would not regard themselves as wealthy. And, of course, we have some uh, supporters in that view. Even that leading member of the Yes campaign, the independent councillor for Midlothian, Peter Devink, 
has expressed concern about wealth creators being chased south of the border by these measures. I heard Councillor De Vink on the BBC Morning Call programme on the 22nd of January. This is the man who stood shoulder to shoulder with Mr Swinney on platforms as part of Yes Scotland. And he said this, and I quote, I don't like the direction of travel. Scotland will be known as a high tax country. This sends out all the wrong signals. We shouldn't be hitting wealth creators. We need to keep them here. I am deeply, deeply disappointed. So even if even Mr Swinney's closest allies are taking such a dismal view of his tax plans, he can hardly blame us for being critical yeah, of them. Absolutely. Indeed, on the phone-in programme I was listening to, Mr Swinney's plans took a pasting from callers, with one exception, someone called Dave from Blair Gowrie, who called in to support Mr Swinney's proposals in fulsome fashion. Now, Dave had a voice that sounded very remarkably like that of Mr Swinney's constituency assistant, <laughs> Councillor Dave Dugan. <laughs> now, surely it can't be the case that the only people prepared to support Mr Swinney's taxes are his own staff members. And he has to instruct them to spend their time calling up radio phone and programmes to support his position. Now, there have been a number of those others involved in, for example, in property, including estate agents, who have expressed similar views. They don't see why Scottish house purchasers should be disadvantaged compared to those south of the border, which is why we have proposed increasing the threshold for the 10% rate to £500,000. And then there is the issue of revenue neutrality. In this, Mr Swinney has been consistent, or so it seems, because in announcing the proposed LBTT changes on October the 9th, he said the tax would be, I quote, raising no more or less than the taxes that they replace. But as Gavin Brown pointed out, the term revenue neutral now appears to have been changed so that it has had not one definition, not two definitions, but three. For at First Minister's questions on the January 22nd, the First Minister took revenue neutrality to mean not simply raising no more or less than the taxes that they replace, but also to include money to go into a cash reserve. So it seems there are three definitions now of revenue neutrality. Definition one is raising no more or less than the taxes that they replace. Definition two is enough to cover the block grant adjustment. And definition three, enough to cover the block grant adjustment and put money into the cash reserve. So here we have Mr Swinney squirrelling away £11 million in Barnet Consequentials, which could be applied to LBTT, and putting that into his cash reserve. Now, we've been very clear, Deputy Presiding Officer. We do not want to see Scots paying higher taxes than those elsewhere in the UK. And we believe that when the Scottish Government says it believes in revenue neutrality, it should do what it says. And we believe that Scottish businesses should not see their competitive position in relation to businesses elsewhere in the UK being slowly eroded. And for all these reasons, we cannot therefore support the Scottish Government's budget today. It is, in the words of Peter de Vink, Mr Swinney's close ally in the Yes campaign, setting Scotland on the wrong road. You must finish, and although please. the figures involved may appear in the great scheme of things to be relatively minor, it is a direction of travel that sets a worrying precedent. For all these reasons, we will, I regret, be voting against the budget at five o'clock today. Thank you very much. I now call in Lewis MacDonald. Maximum eight minutes, Mr MacDonald. Thank you very much. We need to do more, I heard the Cabinet Secretary for Health say yesterday in responding to the accident and emergency figures published this week, which showed performance in Scotland's NHS going in the wrong direction. She was right, and it is that need to do more that we have asked the Government to address, above all in supporting Scotland's NHS. The number of people attending A&E who are not treated within the Government's four-hour target fell in December below 90 per cent for the first time in nearly two years. Shona Robson said that was because of unprecedented pressures, and on one level she was right. Professor Malcolm MacLeod at Forth Valley Royal Hospital in Larbor told the Scotsman earlier this week, every year we get busier and busier, and he was right too. As more people live longer, each year is likely to see more demand than the year before. The pressures would be all the greater if we were faced, for example, with an epidemic of influenza. But health boards already face a challenge in meeting the pressures to which Ms Robison referred. Last week, 
I visited the emergency department at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary along with a number of colleagues and heard about the concerns of senior staff. NHS Grampian is over 300 nurses short of what it needs in order to deliver the services patients are entitled to expect. Some of that can be met by bank nurses working for the health board on an ad hoc basis, but not all. Over 100 posts are unfilled even after this, that is taken into account. It is no wonder Grampian and other health boards find it so hard to meet their targets, despite the fantastic commitment and effort of those who work there. Not enough nurses, not enough senior medical staff either, and Grampian is not the only health board which struggles to recruit the staff it needs to provide their round the clock emergency. Cabinet service. Secretary. I just wonder if Lewis McDonald would take this opportunity to finally welcome the additional NRAT funding for Grampian and the fact that they have additional nurses planned for the Grampian area, which will help to address some of the issues he's just outlining. Lewis McDonald. Well, any step towards the NRAC formula, which the government promised uh, some eight years ago uh, that it would uh, put in place, would, of course, uh, be welcome. Uh, uh, and uh, this small step uh, perhaps goes a little way in that direction. But I think we have to recognise those pressures that I've described uh, are not so easily met. And, of course, likewise, passing on of health consequences today is also welcome. That will uh, do a little to, uh, to help. But it is not enough. The government indeed needs to do more, as we said here two weeks ago and as we have said again today. And that's why we've made a case for a frontline fund to help ease the pressure on a &E and on Scottish NHS services in general. £100 million, all from the remaining Barnet consequentials available to ministers to allow out of hours access for patients to both hospital and primary care services. A frontline fund would signal a willingness to explore new ways of delivering health care out with the standard working week. It might even reduce the number of patients forced to travel for treatment to other board areas or turn to the private sector by making it easier for people to be treated close to home. We all certainly. Sandra White. I thank the member for taking the intervention. You mentioned about uh, private health care. I just wondered if, if yourself or, or your uh, colleagues on the bench agrees with John McTernan, who's newly appointed by your new leader, uh, Jim Murphy. Uh, basically, Labour is committed to 20 billion cuts of cuts if elected. The NHS, NHS needs the savings that privatisation creates. Would you agree with that? Certainly, certainly what I regret is the trend towards more and more patients, including many of my constituents, uh, being referred by the NHS to private sector providers because the provision is not there uh, within their local board area. But we asked at stage one for ministers to discuss future funding with local government. And of, and of course, as we heard today, Mr Swinney has done so and he has found an additional £10 million to offer to local councils. But the way he announced that today can hardly be described as a step in the right direction. Indeed, Jackie Bailey said that the uh, historic concordat between the Scottish Government and local government now lay in tatters following the Deputy First Minister's speech today, and Alec Rowley spelled out clearly what that would mean. As, in a moment. As Mark Macdonald very revealingly said, COSLA no longer speak for local government, not because some councils might withdraw from COSLA, but because COSLA could no longer deliver the deal the Scottish Government wanted. Mr Swinney today criticised local councils on the grounds that they had received specific and sufficient funding to maintain teacher numbers, and that was the reason for him imposing clawbacks and penalties. That sounds very much as if ring fencing is back, as if the concordat is over, as if local councils will pay a price in clawbacks and penalties for not doing the government's bidding, uh, and, and as if consensus somehow comes to an end the moment other people fail to agree with what the government want. Yes. Minister. Gas tax, Mr Macdonald, will you call on all Labour councillors to protect teacher numbers here and now? Lewis Macdonald. In this debate, I will call on Mr Swinney to abandon Order. his plans to take money away from councils, Order. the very money that could be used to help uh, improve the situation. Order, please, we cannot numbers. hear Mr Macdonald. And, and, and I'm sure Ms, Ms Constance will recognise uh, that there are many councils across Scotland which are unable to recruit staff uh, and need support from the government rather than penalties, as has been proposed. And of course, if the government needs to do more to protect our most important public services, it also needs to do more to respond to pressures on our productive economy. 
Of course, the oil economy is in a very different category from the NHS. Every decision in Scotland's National Health Service is the responsibility of the Scottish Government. Every penny that Scottish health boards spend is provided for Mr Swinney's budget. In the oil and gas industry, by contrast, most of the big decisions are made not by governments at all. They are made in the boardrooms of multinational oil companies around the world. And we have heard in the last few days of decisions by oil majors like BP and Shell to cut global investment to the tune of billions of dollars. As a result of that, urgent action is required here in Scotland. We know that many thousands of jobs are at risk in Aberdeen and across Scotland because of the low price of oil. And indeed, Bob Dudley of BP talked yesterday about the price remaining low in the near to medium term, which means that he foresees no recovery in real terms over the next two to three years. And if pressure on the NHS is the biggest challenge facing our public sector, the consequences of that ongoing oil price are the biggest issue facing our private sector and the wider economy. Now, I agree with the Scottish Government that fiscal measures by the UK Government can help in the longer term. They would signal their uh, recognition of the urgency of the problem. I'm glad that both governments supported the Oil Jobs Summit in Aberdeen this week and agreed to work together on a city deal for the Aberdeen City Region. But there is more the Scottish Government can do and there is more it should do in light of its responsibility for the stewardship of the Scottish economy. We have pressed today again for a resilience fund to give local councils the flexibility to support economic sectors facing sudden economic shocks, whichever sector and whichever area uh, that might be. Ministers have not responded positively to that proposal, which is disappointing. Yes, they are promoting the merits of partnership action for continuing employment. I welcome that. It's important that workers facing redundancy get the support they need. But it is also essential that the government assesses the potential impact on the wider economy of a continuing low oil price. I believe if they do so, they will see very clearly the case for a resilience fund close, that we please. have been making. In the meantime, we will continue to remind ministers that they need to do more in both public services and the productive economy, and in part we will do that by voting against this budget tonight. Thank you, and I now call on John Swinney to wind up the debate. Deputy First Minister, you have ten minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I begin on the subject of land and buildings transaction tax and uh, try to address some of the issues that were raised by Mr Brown and also by Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, the, the Government has maintained a consistent position that we did not want to raise any more from the, uh, trans the, the devolution of land and buildings transaction tax and landfill tax than would have been the case had the taxes remained in place. And um, when I ran the assessment of the existing tax provisions uh, as amended by the Chancellor in the autumn statement that generated a revenue sum of £461 million. Unfortunately, so revenue neutrality, to be, I suppose, absolutely consistent at this point, should have been defined as it should have raised £461 million. But the problem was that I could not get agreement with the United Kingdom Government on those estimates, and the United Kingdom Government in fact believed that these taxes uh, would raise £524 million. So after two years of procrastination um, and endless dialogue with the UK Government about trying to get to a point of block grant adjustment, the Chief Secretary to Treasury and I sat down and we had a discussion which essentially went along the lines of my number was 461, his was 524, and on a tremendously sophisticated two years' worth of procrastination basis, we decided to split the difference, and it was £494 million. And that then raised the issue for me. Did, if I wanted to deliver revenue neutrality, was revenue neutrality defined by £461 million or a block grant adjustment of £494 million? And I made it absolutely clear I was not going to inflict upon the Scottish Government's budget an impact of £33 million lost because the block grant adjustment was higher than I thought it reasonably should be. And if Parliament thinks I should have signed up to that, well, Parliament can have that opinion, but I'm prepared to defend my actions in that respect. So having focused on a number of £494 million, I had to work out how much was going to be raised, how much had to be raised in residential land and buildings transaction tax to fill that gap because on non-residential transactions I had not changed my proposals, so I had no need to change my estimates, 
And on landfill tax, I had not changed my proposals, so I had no need to change my estimates. So the amount of money that had to be raised was £235 million to ensure that we were able to deliver comfortably on those numbers. Now, Mr Brown, so that's, that's the explanation. I don't think it's any more... That's all been set out to the Finance Committee in my letter of the 22nd of January to explain the entire narrative. And, uh, of course, I'll give Wayne a second. Just let me complete this, this argument. Um, but if um, Parliament wants me to um, be clear and transparent with it about all of those uh, elements of the calculation, that is exactly the basis upon which the Government has come to this conclusion. I'll give Captain Brown, a new definition of revenue neutral seems to also include putting £15 million into a cash reserve, as we heard today. So would you not accept that that is a tax increase as opposed to being revenue neutral? Uh, no, no, because the, no, because the £15 million is not coming from the revenue raised by land and buildings transaction tax. It's come, it's come from the allocation from within the autumn budget consequentials. So that's precisely it. So, Mr Brown, there's your happy, cheerful answer to your war chest point that you were obviously... So you can, you can call off the Scottish Conservative attack dogs on that particular point. Now, let me... Let me move on then to the, the question of health funding, which has been rather central to this debate. And as I set out in the uh, statement, uh, the, the government originally, uh, in terms of our uh, published plans, would have increased the health service budget by £202 million for 2015-16. But as a consequence of the decisions that we've taken on the autumn statement and the decisions that we took in the budget in, November, in October, we will be increasing the health budget by £383 million, a very substantial increase in the resources that are available to the health service in Scotland. And the health secretary has already announced that um, some of that funding will be used to support NRAC funding, which I would have thought might have got a more cheerful response from uh, Lewis MacDonald, but it was, uh, if that's what they describe as cheerful, I'd, hear to, I'd hate to see the reaction to a broken pay packet. Um, there's uh, money for 32 million for new drugs uh, pressures and support for boards, 30 million on delayed discharge and waiting times, um, and uh, the resources I've announced today on performance, capacity and quality to focus on strengthening the health service in every way we can. Of course, Jackie I'm Bailey. For taking an intervention. Would you accept in what you've just outlined, welcome though it may be, there is not one additional penny that you haven't already announced in this chamber? Yeah. First Minister. Well, what there is, is £383 million more for next year than there was this year for the running of our National Health Service. And in the financial context in which we've got to operate, I think that's a pretty substantial additional investment that's been made. Now, let me then follow through the logic of the Labour Party's position. Jackie Bailey has said today that all of the money in the Barnet consequentials should go to health. Now, even, even if that could all add up to the £100 million fund, which it doesn't, and let's just, we'll, just, we'll, we'll just cast a veil over the fact that there's only £65 million of consequentials available to be allocated, and Jackie Bailey's trying to deliver £100 million. A apart from the arithmetic impossibility of those two points, we'll just cast a veil over that. If Jackie Bailey is saying all the, health, all the Barnet consequentials have got to be allocated for health, then that means the Labour Party is not prepared to support the additional investment we are making in improving educational attainment, in tackling educational inequality, in trying to boost the teacher numbers in our schools, in trying to take the investment in energy efficiency. On that logic, the Labour Party is turning its back on all of that investment that I thought the Labour Party might have supported. Now, Jackie Bailey said in the chamber today that Labour's position was to maintain teacher numbers. And he, absolutely, she says, I'm glad I've had sedentary confirmation of the point, presiding officer. It's always nice to hear it muttered from the side. Ian Gray talked about the fact that the pupil-teacher ratio had deteriorated, that numbers were falling and something had to be done about it. Well, I've come to Parliament and I've set out what I'm going to do about it. And Mr Rowley, anybody that thinks that I don't take seriously dialogue with local government, and frankly, Mr Rowley, you should know all about it. 
of dialogue with local government. I have done more than any other minister in this government to cultivate a strong and positive relationship with local government. But when we get to the point that we are putting money into a settlement and seeing teacher numbers go down, not up, then I think the government is entitled to call time on those particular arrangements. And when, and when Mr Gray was asked by Mr Crawford what money would the Labour Party put in to try to protect teacher numbers, which they're apparently committed to protecting, the answer was absolutely none whatsoever. So I regret, painfully regret the fact that I have not been able to get to a mutual agreement with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities on the issue of teacher numbers. But if I am to respond positively to what is clearly a majority opinion in Parliament that teacher numbers should be protected, because this Government believes that, the Labour opposition apparently believes that we should maintain teacher numbers, I am bringing the constructive and positive action to actually tackle this issue here to Parliament, and that is what we will put to local government in Scotland. Now, the final point I want to make is about the uh, investment that we are making in uh, our young people and in the wider investment in the educational environment in Scotland. We set out our determination to tackle educational inequality and we have made the first clear statement today of £20 million of further investment in doing that. And today it looks as if the Labour Party is going to vote against £20 million to tackle educational inequality in Scotland. And that is a matter of profound regret. They will also be voting... They will, uh, not at this uh, moment. Uh, they're also going to vote against £526 million being allocated to the college budget in Scotland on the basis that that is not nearly enough. Well, £526 million is more than any Labour administration in Scotland ever delivered for the college sector in our country. So, presiding officer, budget. Sorry, the minister's in his final minute. Presiding officer, the setting of budgets is a difficult and challenging task for any administration. And in the financial context in which we are operating, in which, Mr Fraser, our budget has reduced in real terms by 10 per cent since the Conservative government came to office, 10 per cent, we manage within that context to deliver public services in an effective way for the people of Scotland. But what the Labour Party has demonstrated today is that it is unfit to come to Parliament and deliver a coherent argument as to how to handle the budget. Apparently it was all to be about health, then it was to be about local government, then it was to be about colleges, and actually it didn't amount to enough money for any of them in terms of the proposals. This is a budget that is strong, a budget focused on the needs of the people of Scotland, and I encourage Parliament to support it. That concludes the debate on the Budget Scotland No. 4 Bill. The next item of business is consideration of business motion number 12230 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick. On behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme, any member wish to speak against the motion should press the request speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 12230. Formally moved. Thank you. No member has asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 12230, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of a parliamentary bureau motion. I'd ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 12231 on subcommittee membership. Moved. The question on this motion will be put decision time to which we now come. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion number 12226, in the name of John Swinney, on the Budget Scotland number no. 4 bill, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on motion number 12226 in the name of John Swinney is as follows. Yes, 64. No, 53. There were three abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to and the Budget Scotland number four bill is agreed. The next question is that motion number 12231, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on subcommittee membership, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.